Okay, so attachment. Um, attachment um, talks about how children can use um, their primary caregiver or the people around them that they trust um, as a secure base to explore the world. And so they have this internal working model, according to Bowlby, um, of, of how things work and how safe they are. So um, when you talk about uh, attachment research um, in, in sort of the current times, uh, a lot of it is based on the strange situation, especially when you're talking about infant, uh, infant attachment. And the strange situation is referred to in the textbook is a highly scripted lab-based intervention where you um, uh, bring up the primary caregiver. In, historically, it's often been the mother, so I'm going to refer to it as the mother, but it doesn't have to be the mother. Um, the mother and child come into a playroom, and the mother um, puts the child down, and there are some toys, and age-appropriate toys for the child to play with, and for, for exactly three minutes. So every... Uh, every section of the strain situation research protocol um, is, is highly scripted and timed. So for the first three minutes, the child just plays on the floor while the mother reads a magazine or reads a book. After exactly three minutes, um, somebody walks into the room, one of the researchers walks into the room, looks at the mother, says, hi, I'm the stranger, sits down next to her and reads a book. They don't talk at all for three minutes. They just sit next to each other and the child continues to play. At the end of that three minutes, the mother gets up and make sure that the child notices. So if the child has their back to them, they will um, walk around and make sure that the child notices. And the mother leaves the room without addressing the child and without addressing the stranger. And for the next three minutes, the child is in the room alone with the stranger, um, which is an odd situation to be in. That's why they call it the strange situation. And the children typically cry. They're very upset because they're now alone with somebody who they don't know. Um, the researchers expect them to cry. That's not a, an indicator of attachment. Um, if it goes really bad, if, it's, you know, if, if the child is in terrible distress, they will stop the, the research session. But otherwise, they expect the child to cry for three minutes uh, or some portion of that. Then at the end of three minutes, the mother comes back into the room. And what we're looking at is what does that reunion look like? Um, and if the child goes to the mother and is comforted by the renewed presence of the mother, then we say the child has a secure attachment, that they're happy that that person is back um, and life is good again. If they didn't really notice when the person left and also didn't really care when they came back, um, we call that an avoidant attachment style. They're just sort of avoiding the whole issue of, of um, do I care about you? Are you helpful to me? Are you harmful to me? All of that, they just avoid all of that. The anxious, ambivalent, or resistant babies um, have, uh, the, the, the term ambivalent means ambi is both. So if you're ambidextrous, you, you can write with both hands. Um, ambi is both, valence refers to the direction of emotion, whether it's positive or negative. Um, and the anxious, ambivalent, or resistant babies um, are, have the presence of both positive and negative emotions. They approach the, the, the caregiver, they wanna be picked up, but then they're angry with them and they push away when they are picked up. So that's where you get um, that pile. And then some babies are disorganized, and so they, you know, they're, they're sort of disoriented and harder to classify. Now, when I asked you to pause the video before, when we talked about temperament, um, if you didn't, um, those numbers were about 40% of children displayed an easy temperament. Um, about 60% of children display a secure attachment. About 40%, or excuse me, 10% of children displayed a difficult temperament, and about 15% of children um, display an ambivalent temper, uh, attachment. So you're seeing some correspondences with um, easy temperament, secure attachment, and then difficult or slow to warm up, and anxious, ambivalent, or avoidant um, attachment styles. And th the question is, are they two separate things, right? Is attachment a separate thing, or is attachment the behavioral manifestation of, a of, of what a child with that temperament would always do? Um, and so there's, there's a little bit of um, back and forth in the field. I wouldn't say it's controversy, but um, there are different, uh, different uh, uh, opinions about what attachment is and whether it is a separate thing and what, or whether it is really just the manifestation of, of temperament. Um, so um, your book then talks about bi-directional effects, um, how the child affects the parent and how the parent affects the child. I said that I think it's important not to label the child as a difficult child, but as a child that has a difficult temperament. The child that has a difficult temperament, it's difficult for them and difficult for the parent. And so that child is difficult to parent and that parent find, that child finds it difficult to be parented. Um, and so you get these bi-directional effects um, that influence everything. And that's one of the reasons why 
different children in the same family have different experiences because not only do they have different temperaments that turn into different personalities, but their parents parent them differently because of that interaction. So um, when you think about Bronfenbrenner's model of how the individual interacts with everybody in the family, interacts with peers, interacts with teachers, um, and then how those, uh, those systems interact with each other and also with the child, you can see how it, it's complicated. It's complicated to do this research, um, but interesting, um, I think. Um, as you wrap up this chapter, um, it talks about childcare. Um, the takeaway message on childcare, there's a lot of research on it, and I encourage you to, um, to think about it and think critically about it. One of the things that struck me when I was studying this, um, taking a class like this, and then also classes afterwards, was um, I didn't always like the way that they characterized single parent families because I, I was one. Um, I didn't always agree with the way they characterized the role of fathers. Um, and I think if you're a father or a father figure or a mother or a mother figure, or what do those figures mean in today's world where um, social roles have changed um, and uh, you know, there, there, there are a lot of different factors. So as I was reading that portion of the chapter, I think I would have written it differently because I think when you talk about the role of the father, um, you aren't just talking about the biologically you know, male contributor to, to the child, but you, you could be talking about other things as well on different social roles. So um, I think keep that in mind. And if that's something that um, interests you, if that's something that makes you want to do more research, please do. Um, and maybe later in your career, you'll, um, that'll be something that you'd like to do. And if you're interested in how they came up with those findings, I would encourage you to look up the references. I did it several times in this chapter. Um, at the end of a sentence that you either agree with or don't agree with, um, there's a citation. Um, you can look up the full citation in the back of the book and then you can Google it. At a minimum, for free, you can read the abstract. Um, and sometimes you can read the full article and I think it's, um, it, it can be a, a worthwhile endeavor. Um, and then finally, um, in the, one of the announcements this week, I will put, um, a, or, or else in the, the resources, um, I'll put a link to a book, and there's a book written by a really famous um, developmental psychologist, Al Alison Gopnik, um, and she wrote a book about, it's called either Gardner or Carpenter, or Carpenter or Gardner, I don't, I don't have it in front of me right now, um, but she was asking the question, as you approach child development, do you think of the role of um, the world uh, in general, and the primary care caregivers in, in particular, as being the role of a carpenter, and it's their job to build the child into some thing, into some finished product, um, or is it the role of a gardener, where you do the best you can, um, and then you see what develops. You know, when you think about uh, planting a garden, if you think about building a chair, you build a chair. If you think about planting a garden, you don't necessarily know how that garden will come out. It could be a year that there are uh, insect pests, it could be a year that there's a lot of rain, a little rain, um, there could be storms, there could be deer, there could be all kinds of things. And so you do your best to plant a garden. Sometimes it comes up and it's the flowers aren't the color that you planted. And so there's an element there of, of just watching how things unfold versus building something. And so I would encourage you to think about your approach um, to child development and which one of those you think um, is most consistent with your own views. So have a great week um, and let me know if I can help with anything. Bye.